Some people associate instant noodles with broke college students, but instant ramen wasn't created for a bunch of hungry 20-year-olds. The man who invented them was much more ambitious. He set out to solve a hunger crisis in Japan. After World War II, food shortages plagued Japanese cities. So the U.S. supplied wheat flour and encouraged the Japanese to make bread. One man, named Momofuku Andu, didn't understand why his people would make bread instead of noodles, something that was already part of their culture. Andu decided to take matters into his own hands and create a new ramen made to last. He spent a year trying to figure out how to preserve the noodles. He needed a non-perishable, tasty, and easy recipe, but it was a challenge to maintain the robust flavors and unique texture that most people were accustomed to. It wasn't until his wife was making dinner one night and he threw some noodles in a bowl of hot tempura oil that he realized flash frying the noodles was the answer he had been looking for. This method not only dehydrated them, it left small perforations that allowed the noodles to recook quickly. And there you have it. Instant ramen noodles became an instant success. Andu's products gained notoriety when he introduced the packaged ramen in the 1950s and later cup noodles in 1978. His company began selling upwards of 40 billion units every year, and Momofuku Andu became a culinary icon in Japan. So the next time you heat up a cup of instant noodles, remember, you're slurping down a little piece of history. Silly String, that bright, fun, party in an aerosol can, was actually invented by mistake. Believe it or not, it was supposed to help heal your broken bones. In 1972, Leonard A. Fish, an inventor, and Robert P. Cox, a chemist, were granted a U.S. patent for a foamable, resinous composition. The two initially set out to create an aerosol can that could spray an instant cast on a broken leg or arm. And the invention worked! But when it came to packaging their discovery, they tested 500 different types of nozzles. Through their tests, Fish came upon one that produced a string, a string that shot 30 feet across the room. Inspired, they decided to turn their instant cast into a toy. After altering the formula to produce a more colorful, less sticky string, the pair set out to market their product. Neither of them knew the first thing about selling toys, so they made an appointment with Whammo in California. But the meeting didn't go exactly as planned. Fish and Cox sprayed the string all over the office, including on the person they were meeting with. And unsurprisingly, Get out! they were asked to leave the premises. Just one day later, Fish received a telegram from Whammo asking him to send 24 cans for a market test. Turns out that a trace of the silly string was left on a lampshade in the office and was later spotted by Whammo's owners, who themselves demanded a market test immediately. Two weeks later, Whammo signed a contract to license the product now known as Silly String. Little trees. They're a rear view mirror staple, protecting noses from offensive odors all over the world. But where do they come from? Over 60 years ago, a scientist by the name of Julius Simon had a chance encounter with a milkman that changed the course of the air freshener game forever. It was in Watertown, New York. A milkman was making the rounds when he stopped to speak to Julius, a German-Jewish chemist who fled the Nazis and studied alpine tree aromas in the forests of Canada. Said milkman began venting to Julius about the stench that spoiled milk left in his car, and thus the quest began to destroy bad car odors. Julius drew inspiration from the tree aromas he studied by infusing their oils onto paper. In 1954, he filed a patent for tree-shaped paper infused with odor-destroying air perfume. Julius then started producing the air fresheners out of an empty auto shop and sending samples to local gas stations. The little trees were a big hit, and Julius successfully created the first automotive air freshener. Though the look remains the same, the scents are forever changing. Now the little tree company has over 60 cents and has sold over a billion little trees worldwide. I've been making this drink sound so attractive and desirable for all these years. Do you recognize me? I'm the Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. So I've had several people say, 
It's hard to picture that that voice is actually coming from you, the human being. Oh, yeah. They like the voice because they don't know who I am. When I first auditioned, I think they wanted to get the flavor of the Kool-Aid man that was already on the air. Oh, yeah. When I came in, instead of making it, oh, oh, I wanted to go down, oh, oh, oh. So he's got to have a big, deep voice. So I just thought, like, this guy wants to be a, oh, yeah, cool. And I tried to make the voice, uh, you know, just kind of roll around gutturally in my throat. Oh, yeah. I can remember those sessions. After three hours of them just saying, okay, do it again, do it again, do it again, try it again. How about lower, more energy, more this, more Barry White, bigger, 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 louder, louder. I'd be saying like, what, are, what am I not doing that you're not getting? But you're telling me to use a lot of high energy like David Lee Roth. I said, the two don't mix. David Lee Roth going, oh, yeah, doesn't mix with Barry White going, oh, yeah. So you have to find a happy balance. Oh, yeah. Bottoms up. Hmm. <laughs> liquid ass is a stinky liquid that smells like butt crack with hints of dead animal. So there are these guys. Andrew Masters, I make liquid ass. Alan Whitman, liquid ass creator and a head janitor. We make the world's best stink product. <laughs> and they work here. This is what we call the ass factory. They hated their jobs, so they followed their dreams and started a successful prank product company specializing in a really rancid fart spray. But they needed a name. I said, so what are we going to name it? And he's getting ready to sit down and he goes, I don't know, liquid ass? And I'm like, that's it. Then something curious happens. We're making a product specifically for pranks at first, but then we start getting calls from military people. Enter Stu Siegel, this guy. Stu ordered from us, and I've never met Stu. <laughs> it sounds like he's got a, you know, a pretty neat business. He really does. And he came up with the idea to use it for a triage. But the fact is that it goes from prank product to medical field is sort of a, sort of a jump. <laughs> Turns out there's a secondary market for this stuff, training some of the most elite armed forces to do their jobs. And we are a company that is, replicates the environment of combat. And right now we're in a set that we built for medical training. Whoa. Whoa. Basically, before this prank fart spray, some of our best troops and emergency medics we're going into the field completely unfamiliar with the overwhelmingly horrid smells of death and disembowelment that they would probably encounter as part of their jobs. It's a very awful smell. It's something that could actually gag a maggot, as far as I'm concerned. It just smells like liquid ass. Back to these two jokers. Now we have a product out there that's helping military training, which is, uh, it's great, you know? You know, not all heroes wear capes. Cakes, cookies, and brownies. No, we're not going to show you how to make them because they can be made with ease thanks to Betty Crocker, who was born in 1921 in Minnesota. Well, kind of. In 1921, the Washburn Crosby Company, now known as General Mills, ran a contest for people to complete a puzzle for the most coveted prize, a pin cushion. Yes, one of your very own. Surprisingly, a lot of people wrote in to claim their prize, but with a little P.S. How do I make my sponges? How much how long? How much flour should I use? They wanted baking advice. So the customer service department began to reply, and to make their tips seem more genuine, they signed their letters Betty Crocker. Betty, because it was a cheery, all-around, American-sounding name, and Crocker after a board member. Not being a real person didn't stop Betty Crocker from having a very successful radio show, the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, with a different accent in every state. Welcome to the Betty Crocker, Welcome to the Betty Crocker, 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 Crocker Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air. But the lies don't stop there. Let's talk about that added ingredient, the egg. 
You don't need to add a fresh egg to powdered cake mix, but science says it makes us feel like we aren't cheating and we're better providers. So thanks, Betty Crocker, for making us all feel like we know how to bake. The creation of the potato chip is a rather snarky, surprising, and idiosyncratic story. When french fries made their way to America, they soon became a restaurant mainstay. Many restaurants served fries as their signature dish. Believe it or not, they were once considered very hoity-toity. In 1853, George Crum was a chef at the Moon's Lake House in Saratoga Springs, New York. Their signature dish was none other than Moon's Fried Potatoes, or as the aristocrats would say, potatoes served in the French manner. One day, just like any other, a customer some believe to have been Cornelius Vanderbilt himself ordered fries. Upon being served, Cornelius scoffed and sent them back. He deemed the fries soggy and not crispy enough. This insanity continued a few more times, until Crumb lost it. I mean, he really lost it. He fired back, cutting the potatoes paper thin and frying them up. You see, back in 1853, eating with your hands was a major faux pas, making Crumb's revenge even more diabolical. By cutting the potatoes paper thin, there would be no way that Cornelius could use his fork, forcing him to use his hands. Crumb's plan backfired, kind of, as the patrons dug in with both hands and loved them. Saratoga chips were born. They became a Saratoga dining staple. Soon thereafter, they took the world by storm. Crumb himself even opened his own restaurant with baskets of chips displayed on each and every table. 